time, 5 p.m. Pacific, only on C-SPAN. Next, on C-SPAN, it's a hearing of the House Interior and Insular Affairs Subcommittee on General Oversight and Investigations. The subcommittee met on Wednesday to discuss the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's licensing procedures of the Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant. Witnesses include Massachusetts Democratic Governor Michael Dukakis, Consumer Advocate Ralph Nader, and Kenneth Carr, the Chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The Subcommittee on General Oversight and Investigations will come to order. The Subcommittee meets this afternoon to review the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's implementation of nuclear licensing safeguards mandated by the Congress, with a specific focus on the extraordinary manner in which the agency has proceeded at the Seabook Nuclear Power Station. Since 1972, when the New Hampshire Public Service Company made its first application for a certificate of site and facility, Seabrook has served as the nation's test case for issues relating to the safe operation of nuclear power plants in this country. Unfortunately, after 18 years, there is considerable evidence to suggest that this test case has turned out to be a mad scientist experiment akin to Dr. Frankenstein's monster. We have assembled an impressive panel of witnesses that will detail the manner in which the NRC has continually sought to circumvent congressional intent, meaningful public participation, the input of other federal agency, and its own regulations in its zeal to license Seabrook. Much as Dr. Frankenstein gave up his own humanity to breathe life into his monster, so the NRC has compromised its duty to protect the safety of the citizens around the Seabrook facility and around our nation. I will not detail each of the NRC's questionable actions at Seabrook in this statement. Indeed, it will take the entirety of this hearing and much longer to complete the list to highlight a few of the most egregious examples. In 1984, when Seabrook couldn't meet the NRC's requirement for a preliminary showing of the adequacy of an emergency response plan before receiving an all-power license, the NRC simply changed its rules to accommodate Seabrook. When Governor Michael Dukakis and Massachusetts civil defense officials concluded that no plan could be developed to evacuate the beaches near Seabrook in a reasonable amount of time, the NRC simply eliminated its own rule requiring state's approval of emergency plans prior to issuance of a license. In 1986, when the Federal Emergency Management Agency concluded that the Seabrook emergency plans were not adequate to protect the public, the NRC pressured FEMA to reverse their decision. When Ed Thomas, a FEMA official, refused to change his decision, he was demoted. When confronted with its own regulations stating that the emergency plans must be adequate to protect the public, and that plans will be implemented, NRC nevertheless ignored this requirement, stating on March 1st of this year that testimony on whether the plans would actually reduce dose rates to victims surrounding the plant was irrelevant. When faced with a contrary decision from its own appeals board, the NRC simply overrode the jurisdiction of the appeals board in licensing authorization issues, citing the need for efficiency and effectiveness in administrative proceedings. On several of these issues, the NRC has refused to grant hearings to interested parties and has repeatedly sought to frustrate the litigation of the safety issues. Most recently, the NRC, in response to inquiries from my staff and the staff of Senator Kennedy of Massachusetts, has given incomplete and possibly misleading answers to questions concerning the adequacy of certain weld inspection data. Let me state in the strongest terms possible that this hearing is not the last word the NRC will hear from the Congress on the Seabrook issue. It is, in fact, perhaps the first. This hearing is held largely at the request of Congressman Markey of Massachusetts and his colleagues in the Massachusetts delegation. Gentlemen from Alaska, have an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do. Before I have the opening statement, I'd like unanimous consent to submit for the record uh, testimony by Congressman Billy Tozan, Congressman Howard Nielsen, Congressman Mike Oxley, Congressman Ralph Hall, who can't be here today, but wish their record to be in here. Also, Congressman Barbara Bukanovich, if she doesn't appear at time, her, her statement too. Without objection, Mr. so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a copy of the Fitzsimmons Report, a confidential report prepared by the graduate student at the Kennedy School of Government for Governor Michael Dukakis' government, which analyzed steps that could be taken by the governor's office to maximize the political advantage of refusing to participate in the energy planning process of the Shoreham. Without objection, it's so ordered. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, especially the governor, which I do not see at the first panel. I see my two colleagues here, the senator and the representative, also, Mr. Nader, who is a dear friend of mine, 
I'm glad to see that the press is covering this issue so well today so Americans can see some of the leading figures of the opposition of the Democrat Party shed some light on their party's plans for our nation's energy future. Coming from an energy producing state, I have been consistent in my support of utilizing every energy option which we have to insulate ourselves from the economic domination of the foreign energy suppliers who supply us with 58% of our fossil fuels today and who have proven unreliable in the past. One of the main options, of course, Mr. Chairman, is conservation, which I think is good for everyone. I also think aspirin is good for us, according to the cardiologist, but I know if we take 100 aspirins, we're liable to get mighty sick or die. If our only solution to cheap energy for Americans is conservation, I think we will at least take, be sick like we did in 1970, and many of you remember those gas lines. And some of our economy did die. Inflation rose to rapid rates. In fact, I never blame Jimmy Carter for it. I blame this Congress for not looking for the energy picture. There is something central to any discussion by national leaders about the future of energy supplies to this country. How do we balance the benefits of a prosperous society with the cost of such prosperity? We no doubt pay a price for our prosperity, and we probably argue about the cost. But I think it's also important to access the benefits. I'm afraid, and I hope the press is paying attention, that the overzealous conservation of energy may reduce our wealth. Plentiful, cheap energy brings wealth, not just dollars in our pocket, but wealth of society. And employment of the wealth creates and uses energy. This wealth is not done without energy. Wealth, like it or not, comes and relates directly to health. In the U.S., well-to-do people live about four years longer than poor people. Life expectancy in poor nations is typically 20 years less than the rich nations. The American blacks live 20 years longer than the African blacks. The people in Japan live about 11 years longer than any other East Asians. Therefore, if conserving energy reduces wealth in our nation, the health effects alone are staggering. Far more staggering, I must say, than the risk of nuclear energy. I guess I'd feel better if our country was moving forward on some or at least some front to produce energy that our citizens can afford and our industries could use efficiently to compete in the world economy. But we're not. In fact, whether it's OCS program, oil drilling in Alaska, hydropower projects, natural gas pipelines, coal, nuclear, or waste energy projects, there's a group of folks who oppose everything except conservation. Even my two friends down at the table down here oppose opening Anwar. I want to let everybody in on a dirty little secret. That ought to get the press's attention. Every dirty little secret, the press gets excited. That gets attention in the halls of Congress. The American people will conserve energy when the cost of energy goes up or when the benefits of conservation outweighs the costs of conservation. That is what happens when people, free from government, make decisions in the marketplace. It's called free enterprise or capitalism. Under the underparalleled economic growth between President Reagan and sustained under President Bush, the rest of the world is catching on to our system. If imitation is the highest form of flattery, our nation's economic system is being flattered indeed. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm taking a little longer, but one of the chief engineers of our economy is energy. If the leaders of our nation take steps to increase the cost of energy just to promote conservation, our economy will suffer. This is not without precedent. Senator Tim Worth, another leader of the Democrat Party, was quoted on August the 13th of 1988 in the National Journal saying, what, we're what we've got to do in energy conservation is try to ride the global warming issue. Even if the theory of global warming is wrong, to have approached global warming as if it real means energy conservation, so we'll be doing the right thing anywhere, anyway, in the terms of economic policy and environmental growth. I think sometimes, Mr. Chairman, in the haste to achieve ends like conservation, political leaders, and we're supposed to be leaders in this country, are convinced by interest groups to, be, to go by other means. I urge all leaders to be more responsible. If our nation wants to have a strong, growing economy for the poor and those that have not, and can compete with the rest of the world, we must have able energy and a supportable energy for all of those to keep our engines running. In a rich and growing economy made possible by cheap energy, people live longer, are more productive. It will be easier to devote greater resources to taking care of the needs of our citizens if we continue to lead the world economically, environmentally, and democratically. I hate to prejudge the purposes of this meeting, Mr. Chairman. 
but I think it's fair to say it will yield nothing new about how to solve these problems. In fact, I think it's designed to further obstruct, adding to the cost to the consumer, the development of nuclear power as a clean, safe option of providing energy to the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and I thank you for uh, conducting this uh, hearing. Um, it's a, a very important uh, a public airing of uh, a set of issues raised uh, uh, around the way in which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, conducts itself. Um, I requested the hearing because I am concerned that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has lost sight of its statutory health and safety mission and has instead become an advocate for the nuclear utility industry. It is incumbent upon this committee, vested as it is with jurisdiction over the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to provide close public scrutiny of the activities of this agency. The public safety depends on our holding the NRC accountable when it fails to follow the law. The NRC's most recent decision to permit the full power operation of the Seabrook nuclear power plant is a case study in how resistant the NRC has become to faithfully executing the laws. Absent intervening court action, Seabrook will go critical in the near future despite the lack of final approval of evacuation plans for New Hampshire or Massachusetts. It should come as no surprise to the members of this committee that such a situation has arisen. In 1980, in the wake of the Three Mile Island near meltdown, this committee shepherded the passage of a law which required the NRC to establish by rule that an operating license would issue only if there exists an emergency response plan which provides reasonable assurance that public health and safety is not endangered by operation of the facility concerned. Yet, here we are, 10 years later, witnessing the grant of a full power license without an approved emergency response plan. So this is the first lesson of our case study. The NRC does not follow the law. Moreover, the NRC has approved the Seabrook license despite the lack of any provision for sheltering of the beach population if prompt evacuation proves impossible. <laughs> the NRC's own regulations require that response plans include, quote, a range of protective actions. And the NRC concedes that sheltering is one of two essential protective actions. Yet the agency rejected arguments that licensing should not go ahead absence a sheltering plan. Why? Because it noted that the clam shacks on the beach are too flimsy to provide much protection anyway. In other words, the lack of effective sheltering, which common sense tells you should be a reason not to proceed, has been twisted by the NRC into the reason why it is okay to proceed. So now we have the second lesson of our case study. The NRC does not follow its own regulations. For nearly 20 years, the citizens of Massachusetts and New Hampshire have been trying to get the NRC to wake up to the folly of building a nuclear power plant on a crowded beach within uh, which is already impossible to leave rapidly on a typical Sunday afternoon in July. When the site was first approved, no emergency response plan was required beyond a 1.5 mile radius. Conveniently, the beach was 1.9 miles from the plant outside the emergency planning zone. Nevertheless, the attorneys general of both Massachusetts and New Hampshire, as well as citizen interveners, attempted to head off the choice of this site. They failed because the NRC regulations did not require consideration of serious accidents threatening the beach population. They were called too improbable. But then the improbable happened at Three Mile Island, and emergency planning was expanded to 10 miles. Now there was no escaping the grim reality that if the improbable occurred at Seabrook, 10,000s of men, women, and children might die in the panic 
as tens of thousands of beachgoers tried to evacuate the area of a two-lane road. Was the site abandoned? Of course not. Instead, the NRC and the utility have bent every conceivable rule to allow licensing to proceed. They have gone so far as to turn the reasonable assurance standard legislated by this committee into a travesty. When we passed the reasonable assurance standard, we intended that beachgoers be protected from lethal radiation doses. It is obviously not reasonable to let a plant operate if that minimum standard cannot be met. Yet the NRC now says that reasonable assurance only requires that a plan for evacuation be established. Any inquiry into whether the plan is sufficient to protect beachgoers at Seabrook from lethal doses of radiation in the event of a serious accident is, in the words of the NRC, irrelevant. There is a yawning gap between what the NRC assumes will happen during a serious accident at Seabrook and what actually will happen. It is a gap which we must make every effort to close before it is too late. The people living it within the 10-mile radius did not ask for this. It was imposed upon them. And now they are told that they have no choice. After all, isn't it a waste of $5 billion to keep this plan from operating? Well, let me tell you something. The people of Massachusetts and New Hampshire do not want to waste $5 billion. They don't want this to go on their rates. They don't want all this money to have been expended. On the other hand, they do not want their children, they do not want their families to be living within a 10-mile radius of a nuclear power plant with no um, certified emergency evacuation plan. What a choice for families to make. $5 billion wasted of their money, no one else's money, not money from Alaska, not money from Idaho, not money from Montana, our money wasted. A choice has to be made. The safety of their children against their electric bills, a heartbreaking choice, a choice no family should have to make. But in the end, it's an easy choice, and it's the choice that any family would make who had to expose their children, their families to this kind of risk. And that choice is that this plant should not open without emergency <laughs> evacuation plans. That's all this debate is over. It's not over national energy policy. It's not over the ANWR reservation. It's not over Jimmy Carter. It's over the rights of people who have paid for a nuclear power plant themselves with their electricity rates as to whether or not this plant should open if, they ca if their children cannot be protected. Plain and simple, the NRC is not following the law their own regulations are common sense. I welcome the, if I may, the, the uh, uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Marvulis, Senator uh, Kennedy, who have been uh, leading this fight over the last uh, decade. Uh, Governor Dukakis is uh, en route. His plane was delayed, but he, he will uh, be arriving for this hearing to uh, join them. Uh, and uh, amongst them, uh, they have been leading this uh, crusade uh, throughout the 1980s, and really for uh, uh, the truth be told, back into the 1970s as well. I thank you. Does the gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Faliyama Vega, member of the subcommittee, have an opening statement? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman, but I would defer to our colleagues from the other side of the aisle if they... Gentleman from uh, Oregon, Mr. Smith, a member of the full committee. I do have a, uh, an opening statement, Mr. Chairman. I share my colleague's concern about the manner in which this hearing was convened. It is inappropriate that Mrs. Vukanovic, as the ranking member of this subcommittee, found out about this hearing through a press release issued by Mr. Markey only hours after the vote by the NRC on the Seabrook license. I am also concerned about the propriety of having this hearing on the eve of the final decision by the courts on the issuance of the Seabrook full power license. As we all know, because of the Pillsbury and Morgan Court decisions, the ability of the members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to answer specific questions about cases still pending is extremely limited. I understand completely that the NRC may not be able to answer specific questions about Seabrook as fully as perhaps some of my colleagues would like. I ask that my colleagues keep in mind the limitations imposed by the courts. I support the use of safe nuclear power as means of producing electricity. The use of nuclear energy is vital to this nation's ability to become energy self-reliant and remain competitive in the world marketplace. 
to foreclose any energy option, much less one with such a long and commendable safety record, would be short-sighted and foolish. Nuclear reactors currently provide 20% of this nation's electricity. Regions such as New England would face a severe energy shortfall without nuclear power. I'm saddened that some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who have never even visited the Seabrook plant for an objective evaluation seem to want their constituents to freeze in the dark. I know there has been a lot of talk about the NRC changing its rules, but we must keep in mind the rules in all federal agencies change on a regular basis. The rules on emergency planning for nuclear plants were promulgated in 1980 a full decade ago. In that decade, we have learned more and we have seen situations develop that were not anticipated when the rules first came out. The federal government made the changes necessary to preserve an important energy option. Those changes have been challenged in the Congress and in the courts, and they have been upheld in both places. We in Congress have granted the flexibility to all federal agencies to interpret their rules and change them as necessary. It is a system that has worked well. The changes made at the NRC were fully within their jurisdiction. They were based on demonstrated need for the change, and they were made after allowing appropriate public comment. That is the way the system works. Again, I would caution the commissioners not to answer any questions if doing so would affect ongoing adjudicatory or court proceedings. I thank the chairman. The uh, gentleman from Montana, Mr. Marlinet, a member of the full committee. Thank the chairman. Um, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, my full statement. Mr. Chairman, I could have <coughs> just about written verbatim the statements that would be given by various members of the committee as to what was going to happen, the, the type of debate that would take place. We've come a full circle. I remember some years ago this committee made a trip to Long Island, there to discuss the Shoreham nuclear plant, which was an investment of six billion, B billion dollars. Now, originally, the NRCC had given their approval to go ahead. The local jurisdiction, the elected officials in that area had put their stamp of approval on that particular power plant. Construction proceeded, an investment of six, after much de delay, an investment of six billion dollars was made to generate electricity which would benefit the people of that area, provide jobs, uh, decrease their dependence on Canadian imported power. Well, that was fine and good, except they had a re-election at the local level, the lo lowest level of government. And the environmental activists, the anti-power activists, the Union of Concerned Scientists came in and convinced that local government that they should oppose providing, when they had once agreed, providing a, an evacuation plan. Another tool that the anti-nuke people can use to stop the construction or final implementation of any power plant. There must be a way around that kind of obstructionism. So therefore, I find the complete cycle has been made and we're back here once again to the basic issue of an evacuation plan by a local community. We're here to review the licensing, the Seabrook plant, and whether the Seabrook plant receive its full power license on March 1st, seven, after 17 years of delay. And those delays in Seabrook have been staggering. Um, Costs have risen, risen by $2 billion, more than it costs to build a nuclear power plant in France or Japan. However, the fact of the matter is that Seabrook has a full power license and interveners have achieved nothing except delaying Seabrook operation, dramatically increasing its plant costs. I wish and I hope that some of the Union of Concerned Scientists the people that are in there, the anti-nuclear people, would stick around and help the people of New Hampshire and Massachusetts pay the high electric bills they caused instead of flying off uh, to the next nuclear power plant to again delay, impede, and agitate in those local areas, even when those local areas had once approved 
the construction of those sites. Now, if you want to turn down Seabrook, if you want to close it down like they did Shoreham, if you want to increase the dependence on foreign oil and foreign energy, go ahead and do it. I, wel I would welcome you to the third world nations where such kind of, where we don't have the opportunity for electrical generation and good power for our people. Welcome to the third generation up there. And while you're at it, continue to ship out your elected representatives as your population base goes out and places like California and other places inherit the number of elected representatives you have because you can't provide the job and quality of living that, that uh, is necessary in your area. The uh, gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Fali Vega, member of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, as a member of our subcommittee on oversight and investigations, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to say a few words in our hearing this afternoon. At the outset of our hearing today, let me say that I understand and am aware of the legal intricacies over whether the commissioners of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission can be required to or should testify on substantive issues currently being litigated. Udall and understand the concerns raised therein. Nevertheless, as a member of the legislative branch of our government who is responsible directly to the people, I believe my view of the safety of the citizens and residents of this country may be different than that of those responsible for the licensing of nuclear reactors. The U.S. Constitution gives the Congress appropriate powers to oversee a generally well-intentioned but sometimes an abusive administration, which is also assigned with the difficult responsibility of managing the day-to-day -day operations of the executive branch of government. It is in within, the, within the system of checks and balance among the three branches of our government that must be sustained. If the executive branch claims executive privilege to every issue that concerns the public, how will the Congress fulfill its responsibility to the public as well? Acting pursuant to what I believe are powers vested in the Congress by the, the Constitution, I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for taking the initiative to conduct this hearing this afternoon. Mr. Chairman, those of you from this part of the world are all familiar with the accident which occurred at the Three Mile Island, Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. This accident happened in a well-designed power plant being operated by trained operators. Accidents happen, and they must be planned for. While the Nuclear Regulatory Commission may not particularly enjoy the legal and administrative battles necessary to get a nuclear power plant licensed, the system is far superior to a governmental system which can let a Genoble slip through its well-intentioned precautions and well-meaning assurances that humans will be protected against the dangers of nuclear power. Mr. Chairman, I'm particularly sensitive to nuclear issues. As a representative from the Pacific region, I have read with alarm the manner in which our government conducted atmospheric and underwater nuclear tests in the Pacific. As a member of the Insular and International Affairs Subcommittee also, I have listened and heard with horror the stories of fellow Pacific Islanders who were severely injured due to being subjected to radioactive fallout from nuclear detonations which were exploded at that time. Mr. Chairman, to this day, even the government of France continues to conduct underwater nuclear tests in the Pacific to the detriment of the people of the Pacific and the serious consequences done to our overall marine environment. With these events as a backdrop to the licensing of, licensing of Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant for full power operation, I do not rest easy hearing that the commissioners responsible for the regulation of nuclear power plants in the United States refuse to provide the Congress with answers to legitimate questions which relate to the safety of the residents around the Seabrook plant. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, having said all this, I hope we are able to conduct a productive hearing in a manner which will enable the Congress to do its job and the executive branch to perform both its judicial and executive functions. I believe this can be done, and it is that goal to which I hope we can all strive for. Mr. Chairman, I think we need to be reminded of the harmful effects of radioactivity. And I think what was done in the Pacific in the past ought to be that re <coughs> reminder to all of us what are the consequences of radioactivity. The issue is not necessarily whether uh, the use of nuclear power plants, but it's really the measurement of the quality of the safety <coughs> and the precautions taken by both the federal and state governments to see that if this is done to assure, as it is with our commitment to provide for the health, safety, and welfare of our communities throughout the United States. And I think that's the core of the issue that we need to 
get to at, the, at this hearing. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Humphrey of New Hampshire has asked uh, that his statement be a part of the record. It is without objection. We welcome our first panel, Representative Marbrulis from Massachusetts and Senator Kennedy from Massachusetts. We apologize for the delay. Senator, if you would proceed. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I first of all want to thank you very much for holding these uh, hearings on a matter of uh, enormous importance and consequence, not only to the people of Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but I think across this nation to find out uh, whether uh, we in this Congress are going to permit an agency, an independent agency, basically be a rogue ag agency. If there are safety uh, problems uh, that develop in terms of an application, ignore them. If there are evacuation plans that don't please the regulatory agency, override them. And if there are regulations in which in any way infringe in terms of uh, granting uh, further nuclear licenses, uh, redraft the regulations. Uh, this is a rogue agency, Mr. Chairman, and you do a great service in having these hearings and to help illuminate that fact. I also want to thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for coming over to the Armed Services Committee and giving us the benefit of this committee's uh, information and very thorough examination in, in the case of the Estello uh, nomination. I think that the work that you and this committee had done brought uh, additional uh, information to our own responsibility in terms of advice and consent, and we're grateful to you. I want to uh, thank our friend, uh, Congressman uh, Markey, for his steadfastness on uh, this issue over a long and continuing uh, period of uh, time. He's really been a leader not only on this issue, but on so many other issues involving uh, safety and the security of uh, people. I know that uh, we are here today. His efforts and the work of Dick Marbrulis, the other members of the uh, congr congressional delegation who have urged uh, this uh, hearing, and uh, we're indeed uh, grateful to them. And I also want to thank uh, the committee for its willingness to hear uh, the, uh, Larry Alexander, who is the chairman of our Joint Committee on Energy, the general um, in our great and general court, one of the most knowledgeable individuals on this uh, particular issue, uh, Steve Jonas, who's representing the Attorney General, Bob uh, Bacchus, who's the Seacoast uh, Anti-Pollution Alliance. They'll be testifying later in the day, but they are individuals both uh, by uh, their uh, knowledge and their background that I think will be enormously helpful to the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, point out it's interesting to listen to those who um, haven't followed the long, difficult, complex period involving the efforts of the NRC to provide for uh, the licensing of, of uh, Seabrook, uh, talk about the costs. Uh, the fact is, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that the points that are being raised by many of us who are testifying here today are points that we raised some 10 years ago. And it's been the fact of the matter that the Nuclear Regulatory Agency has rode roughshod over these observations that this matter has uh, finally come to the point where enormous amounts of monies have been effectively uh, invested by the average uh, taxpayers and uh, what uh, really uh, now they're faced with an extraordinarily expensive system uh, and one that doesn't really guarantee the kinds of rights and protections in terms of the health and safety of those individuals. It's an absolute outrage, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, for those that are talking about to the cost we wish they had been a part of this whole process a number of years ago when if uh, the matters that are still being debated and discussed today uh, were attended to in a responsible way, uh, I don't believe that we would be uh, putting uh, the average families in those uh, communities uh, at the risk that they, they are today. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, members of the committee, I'd like to focus just on one aspect uh, that the uh, NRC has uh, refused uh, to deal with and just mention uh, a few of, of these other items and ask that my full statement be included uh, in the record. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman and members of the committee, appreciate the opportunity to review with you the circumstances surrounding the issuance of the full power operating license in the to Seabrook Nuclear Station. In this brief appearance, it's impossible to review the entire convoluted chain of NRC rulings and administrative law proceedings which have culminated in the current unacceptable situation. But the bottom line is clear. The NRC has granted a full power operating license to a nuclear power plant of uncertain quality that lacks a state-sponsored emergency response plan in Massachusetts. And the utility-sponsored plan that the Commission has approved 
will not protect the citizens of the area in the event of a severe radiation release from an accident at Seabrook. Over the years, the NRC has taken a series of actions on Seabrook, which when viewed together, paint a portrait of an agency that has subordinated its primary mission of public health and safety to the preservation of the nuclear energy option. The NRC is reluctant to take timely actions or consider issues that could ultimately result in the denial of a license or prevent the restart of shutdown reactors. Long before the recent battles over emergency planning, the NRC's predecessor agency arbitrarily reduced the so-called low population zone to exclude the dense summer beach population near Seabrook so the reactor site could be approved. After Three Mile Island, the Seacoast Anti-Pollution League sought an early hearing on the feasibility of the evacuation for the emergency planning zone before the commitment of additional billions of dollars created such a large vested interest in the project that an unbiased consideration of the emergency plan issues on their merits became impossible. The Commission denied the League's request. The plan went ahead without consideration of the massive roads and bridges that would have been required to make significant reductions in radiation exposure possible through swift emergency evacuation. Today we're faced with a completed reactor in the area that the government of Massachusetts determined cannot be evacuated in a way that adequately protects the health and safety of residents. The Commission's pronouncements in this area have long since ceased to make sense. Checklists of procedures to be followed and general standards to be met in drawing up emergency response plans have completely replaced attempts to estimate the likely radiation dose reduction to residents from various proposed emergency response options. In fact, the Commission will not even accept testimony on this point, even though the whole point of evacuation planning is to provide real radiation dose savings to the public. This approach flies in the face of rationality and common sense, and it speaks volumes about the inadequacy of the Commission's regulations. The NRC has constructed a regulatory framework in which it never needs to confront the inconvenient, unpleasant reality that in the case of a serious accident in Seabrook, tens of thousands of people awaiting evacuation might be subjected to lethal doses of radiation. Recently, I've been looking at another question relating to Seabrook. Can the NRC verify through the system of identifiable, retrievable records required by Appendix uh, B of its own regulations, and we'll include those in the record, in the case of significant conditions adverse to quality, records shall be identifiable and retrievable. Um, that the licensee has found the root cause of and then adequately corrected every safety significant effect identified during the plant's many years of construction. NRC inspection reports for Seabrook do not provide a clear and consistent record of how, when, and why specific deficiencies originated and how, when, and, and by whom they were corrected. More often than not, these inspection reports represent a small random sample of plant activities at any given time virtually guaranteeing a lack of continuity between inspection reports. As I have discovered from my own recent inquiry in the ultimate disposition of rejected weld radiographs at Seabrook, the NRC appears to lack prompt access to information about how and when significant quality assurances were resolved. In approving a full power operating license for Seabrook on March 1st, Chairman Carr stated, we see nothing at present that persuades us that Seabrook cannot be operated safely. Before issuing a license, I believe the Commission should be persuaded that the plant is safe to operate, not merely that it has nothing before it at present that suggests the plant cannot be operated safely. The Commission's current approach places the real burden of assuring safety on interveners, whistleblowers, and future reappraisals that come after a serious mishap occurs. This approach deflects accountability for safe operation from where it properly rests with the owners, operators, NRC staff, and the Commission itself. On March 1st, Chairman Carr also stated, while we have concluded today that there are no impediments to authorization of a full power license for Seabrook plant, should new aspects of these issues or new problems arise which require enforcement action, we will not hesitate to take any necessary steps <coughs> to assure that the public health and safety are protected. Based on the record, this willingness to consider new issues will not necessarily result in steps that postpone operation of a plant while the issue is being resolved. The excessive leak rates at Three Mile Island, for example, while known to the NRC staff, did not result in an order to shut down the plant and the rest is history. 
A few days before the March 1st commission vote, I was informed of a 1984 Labor Department proceeding concerning the alleged wrongful termination of Joseph Wampler, a senior level welder examiner who had been employed at the Seabrook plant in the fall and winter of 83. The transcript of this proceeding contained testimony from Mr. Wampler indicating a high 20% rejection rate for weld radiographs at Seabrook. To my knowledge, no NRC Seabrook inspection report had ever been made reference to this problem or how it was resolved. On February 27th, I sent Chairman Carr 15 questions related to this matter and asked that the Commission resolve it in a matter that fully convincingly disposes of any threat to the public health and safety before allowing the Seabrook license to become effective. While the NRC declined to answer any of the specific questions before the March 1st vote or at any time prior to today, I was provided with a copy of the Executive Director's February 28th Memorandum to the Commission, which concluded there are no new issues material to full power li licensing involved. I found that contention puzzling in light of the inability of the Commission at the time to ascertain what the deficiencies were and how they've been resolved. I have since learned that what is involved are safety-related wells in the reactor cooling and main steam systems. How then is it possible for the Commission to express ignorance of Mr. Wampler's concerns while also expressing confidence that they were not serious enough to affect licensing? To support their snap conclusion that my request involved no new issues material to full power licensing, the Commission forwarded a copy of a February 28th memorandum from Mr. William Russell, the Region 1 Administrator. While avoiding direct answers to any of my purported questions, this memo purported to document by reference to previous Seabrook inspection reports that the problem of the rejected weld radiographs had been tracked and resolved by the Plant Quality Assurance System. But the documents cited in the memorandum do not support this conclusion and in fact raises question about the accuracy of some of the statements in Mr. Russell's memorandum. This raises the possibility that the Commission made a determination to approve a full power license to Seabrook based on representations from the NRC staff and were at least unsubstantiated by the inspection record and quite possibly in error. And I'd like to review briefly the specific matters in dispute. Mr. Russell's memorandum says that Region 1 completed an expedited review of Mr. Wampler's concerns, which concluded that, quote, no current conditions material to full power license are involved. The meaning of this phrase is not clear. The issue is the quality of safety-related wells at Seabrook. If the NRC staff believed that all the issues relating to Mr. Wampler's rejected radiographs were resolved, then the, manner, then the memorandum should have said that. It should have said, in plain English, we've examined the records relating to these wells, and they show that <coughs> the deficiencies identified by Mr. Wampler were correct. If the NRC staff did not know this to be the case, then the memoranda should have said, we don't know, but we are investigating. Mr. Russell's memoranda says that the settlement agreement reached between Mr. Wampler and his employer did not deny the NRC information. <coughs> on the examiner's concerns since he had already reported those concerns to the NRC plant inspector. This statement is misleading because the settlement agreement did bar Mr. Wampler from making further disclosures unless ordered to do so by a court, tribunal, or agency of competent jurisdiction, and the NRC did not inquire further about his concerns. The Russell Memoranda says no current component condition that would impact operational safety was identified. But it does not identify whether this assessment is based on a review of any reports or documents relating to the weld radiographs rejected by Mr. Wampler. Licensee records documenting the steps taken to correct deficiencies are supposed to be identifiable and retrievable, according to the Commission's own regulations. Where are the records and reports which show that all these items were corrected? <coughs> the Russell Memorandum says our assessment is that a 20% reject rate of radiographs during the first review by a level 3 examiner is not unusual. I strongly urge the subcommittee to check the accuracy of that statement. I have been advised that it is not correct and that a rejection rate of about 5% is what is usually experienced in a well-run weld examination program. 
The Russell Memoranda says that after Mr. Wampler departed the site, the license <coughs> E performed a 100% check of the radiographs and required a re-radiographing and rework as appropriate for any weld. The 1990 NRC report cited in support of this statement does not, in fact, substantiate it. This report merely mentions the existence of an independent third-party review of all radiographs stored on site and references two earlier documents, which likewise fail to substantiate the claim. Furthermore, I believe the nameless independent third party is actually Yankee Atomic Electric Company, a contractor with long-standing ties to the licensee. Hence the suggestion that a comprehensive independent check was conducted after Mr. Wampler left the site is particularly misleading because Yankee Atomic was performing the same review function before Mr. Wampler left the site. In fact, I've received information indicating that these same Yankee Atomic review, reviewers were also rejecting about 19% of the radiographs, the same percentage as Mr. Wampler, while he was still working at Seabrook. Moreover, the NRC has still not provided any evidence to support the statement that a comprehensive well review and repair program was conducted after Mr. Wampler left Seabrook. If such evidence exists, it should be readily retrievable. The Russell Memoranda says that a 1983 inspection report documents acceptable completion of the last two deficiency reports generated by Mr. Wampler, and that his concerns were being properly handled by the replacements. In reality, the reference report does not document accepted, acceptable completion of Mr. Wampler's last two deficiency reports, and no mention is made of the 16 deficiency reports that Mr. Wampler told the NRC resident inspector he was preparing at the time of his firing. Moreover, Mr. Wampler's replacement reported for work the day the cited investigation ended, making it impossible for the resident inspector to certify legitimately uh, that the replacement was properly handling Mr. Wampler's concern. Mr. Chairman, I suspect there are additional holes in the NRC's account of this episode, and I urge you not to close the book on this matter till all of these have been thoroughly explored. NRC's written inspection reports reveal very little about what is actually going on at a nuclear power plant. The phrase which appears in many of these reports, no violations were observed, does not mean that everything is going well. It simply means that the NRC inspectors did not discover among the unusually small sample of items they looked at, problems that were not already being tracked by the licensee's quality assurance program. Thus, to avoid a formal finding of violations at Seabrook, the contractors would engage in frantic attempts to write up every problem in the areas the inspector was likely to visit to get it in the system before the inspector arrived. How and when these so-called written up items were resolved is not tracked in NRC inspection reports unless they become the subject of a special deficiency report. Apparently, several such deficiency reports and a large number of weld radiographs were in preparation when Mr. Wampler was fired from Seabrook. The fate of these draft reports and what the licensee did to correct the problems identified in these reports is not shown in any of the NRC's inspection reports that have been made available uh, to any of the committees. I understand the NRC staff is continuing its search for additional information. Mr. Chairman, I, at this point I'd like to provide for the record the copies of my correspondent with the NRC and related documents on the matter of the uh, well radiographs and the NRC uh, coaching of the Seabrook owners. Without objection, they're part of the record. Mr. Pre Chairman, my experience with the NRC over many years on Seabrook has convinced me there is an urgent need for reform of this agency. The NRC staff should not be permitted to act as an interested party and advocate for the licensee and reactor licensing and restart decisions. This places the staff in a conflict of interest posture with respect to their basic safety mission, and this conflict ex exerts harmful pressures which are felt throughout the NRC's regional organizations. The staff's sole mission should be that of an independent inspector and technical advisor to the Commission. The Commission made its licensee decision on Seabrook without reviewing the best available information regarding the feasibility of emergency evacuation from the region around the plant. Nor did the Commission have all the information about the plant's condition that is required to support a determination that the plant is safe to operate. The apparent failure to comply with App Appendix B of the Commission's regulation, as manifested to date by the recent revelations of widespread radiograph problems and indication of suspect wells, leads me to conclude that the Commission had insufficient information 
to determine that the quality of the Seabrook plant meets the Commission's fundamental standard of ensuring that operation of nuclear power plant will not jeopardize public health and safety. The Commission should immediately revoke its approval of the Seabrook full power license, and it should not take up this matter again until it is prepared to avail itself of the full range of available information concerning the plant's condition and the dismal real-life prospects for successful emergency evacuation. Thank you. Mr. Mavrulis? <coughs> thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you very, very much, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to appear before you and your colleagues. Mr. Chairman, for the record, I would like to submit to the committee a photograph dated August 8, 1988, which is 1 1.67 miles from the reactor. It's a summer day. It's Hampton Beach, New Hampshire, approximately 50,000 people on a beach in New Hampshire. On a summer day in 1988, I would like to submit that to you for your review. Without objection, it's part of the record. If I may for a moment, I would like to point out here on the map that these are all secondary roads, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee. And the only main thoroughfares we talked about, we talked about safety, is I-495 and I-95 leading to and from Massachusetts up to New Hampshire and north and south. The plant is over here to the right, off the map. And all of these are secondary roads, mostly two-car or two-lane uh, uh, thoroughfares. I'm trying to put in perspective here the dangers, the areas of evacuation. <clears throat> and that is the argument coming from an individual who is not against nuclear power. I have never spoken against nuclear power. I am never on record, but I also represent six of the communities within the 10-mile radius. And we've got to take this very seriously because we who live there understand the issue a lot better than those who are making decisions from the outside. Now, Mr. Chairman and my colleagues, there have been numerous concerns expressed by my colleagues and me on the regulatory oversight of the NRC as regards construction and design of the plant, and I still harbor these concerns. But I am confident that others appearing before you this afternoon with technical expertise on plant construction will ably cover these issues. Thus, I would like primarily to focus my concern on the inadequacy of the emergency evacuation plan, which the utilities have provided for the Massachusetts communities and on the regulatory process of the NRC. I will attempt to explain some of my concerns to you, and I would also like to submit for the record an overview of the Massachusetts evacuation plan that clearly outlines in more detail some outstanding concerns of the evacuation plan. I submit these to, uh, for the record, Mr. No, Chairman. Action, a part of the record. As early as 1975, when the NRC was considering the construction permit for Seabrook, the Attorney General of Massachusetts expressed his opposition to the siting of Seabrook Station. He argued then that the infrastructure of the area roads was not sufficient to handle the needs of a mass evacuation. Unfortunately, these concerns were ignored. In essence, the Commission said construction could proceed and that the evacuation issue would be dealt with once the plant came up for its license. And as you know, after the accident at the Three Mile Island in 1979, the nation as a whole realized how ill-prepared we were to respond to a nuclear accident. And even after this accident, the earlier objections to Seabrook's evacuation plan remained unanswered, and the NRC allowed construction to continue. The emergency planning rules adopted by the Commission in 1980, mandated by Congress, require that an acceptable emergency evacuation plan be prepared for communities within a 10-mile radius of a commercial reactor. Six communities in my district, Salisbury, Newberry, West Newberry, Amesbury, Newburyport, and Merrimack, are within this distance from Seabrook. <clears throat> Unfortunately, 
the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has strayed from its mandate to protect the public. Established as an independent agency under the Energy Reorganization Act of 1974, it has consistently served to protect the interests of the nuclear industry rather than those of the general public. Its primary responsibility to protect the health and safety of the American people has been largely ignored. In a headlong rush to promote the use of commercial nuclear energy, on many occasions the agency has refused to fully consider concerns raised by state and local governments and the affected public. In the case of Seabrook, the Commission has time and again revised its own rules to accommodate the needs of the utility companies building the plant. In September of 1987, an emergency plan for Massachusetts communities was submitted to the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board by the utility for approval. I am submitting for the record, Mr. Chairman, a chronology as you have before you. The federal uh, activities by the NRC, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the interveners of the emergency planning activities for both the New Hampshire and Massachusetts communities. Mr. Chairman, the plans endorsed by the NRC simply cannot be deemed a responsible effort to minimize radiation exposure during a nuclear accident. Indeed, the NRC's own appeal board asked that the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board revisit four significant issues in the New Hampshire evacuation plans. These issues were the handling of, of advanced life support patients at nearby institutions, teacher participation in the evacuation of school children, the lack of a sheltering plan for the beach population, and deficiencies in the survey to determine special population needs. Yet, incredibly enough, when the appeal board remanded the New Hampshire evacuation plan to be reworked, it was overruled by a law NRC panel and was then preempted by the commissioners themselves. This astonishing and unprecedented breach of the commission's own process reflects some kind of stampede to get this plant licensed no matter what the cost and credibility are in public safety. In fact, my colleagues, the Commission has preempted not only the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the local communities, but their own internal process as well. The Atomic Safety and Licensing Board assigned to Seabrook found in its partial initial decision that it will take from seven and a half to eight and one half hours to evacuate the EPZ including heavily populated beach areas around Seabrook in the regulatory guidance document NUREG 0654 states that a release of radiation can occur in as little as one half hour from the time of initiation of an accident. Additionally, the utility plan estimates a resident population of the six communities in my district of 53,000 530 people. While this plan relies on bus companies to transport small children, transit-dependent individuals, hospital and nursing home patients, there is no agreement on the number of drivers who could be counted upon. Also, the only major, major thoroughfares, as I pointed out to you, are I-95 and I-495. All of the secondary roads within the six Massachusetts communities are standard two-lane highways. And there is no realistic option for expanding the roadways. The two centers for monitoring and decontaminating evacuees in the Massachusetts portion of the emergency planning zone are located in Beverly and North Andover, Massachusetts. These centers are prepared to provide for only 20% of the population. I want to repeat that. They're, they're prepared to provide for only 
of the population. The reception center for the communities of Merrimack, Amesbury, and West Newbury, with a total population of 20, 23,101, is North Andover, which is located approximately five miles outside of the emergency planning zone. The only major highway in that direction is I-495. And consequently, much of the travel will have to be on secondary roads. And this is for the record, highways 108, 110, 113, and 125. The reception center for the, uh, for the Salisbury, Newberry, and Newburyport areas is Beverly, which is located approximately 10 miles beyond the EPZ. At each location, my colleagues, the facility consists of one trailer with 16 to 18 monitoring stations and only two showers. When this issue was raised with the ASLB, the board stated that there was no time requirement within which de decontamination must be accomplished. It does not take a genius to figure out that the longer you are contaminated, the greater the exposure to radiation. This is far from being an acceptable response for the protection of public health. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in my judgment, has done a terrible job of addressing the growing concerns of the public in protecting their health and safety. And furthermore, my colleagues, I was appalled when FEMA announced on March 14, 1988, that they were reversing their June 4, 1987 finding that the state of emergency preparedness in the beach areas was inadequate due to the large population and lack of sheltering capability. There was no basis for reversing this decision because no new facts had arisen. Mr. Chairman, there has been much discussion about New England's need for, for additional energy sources. I do not argue that point. But in my judgment, Seabrook is not the answer. This month marks 11 years since the accident at Three Mile Island. We learned then that it was necessary to put in place workable evacuation plans that, it seems, is the very least we can do if we are to use this technology. We have regulations on the books requiring workable evacuation plans. But at Seabrook Station and elsewhere, we have seen the NRC abuse both the spirit and the letter of those regulations, as well as its own internal processes. Virtually no one familiar with the areas around Seabrook believes it can be evacuated in a timely manner. Nothing put forward by the NRC or Seabrook's builders in the 11 years since Three Mile Island, or in the 15 years since this issue was raised by the Attorney General of the Commonwealth, has convinced the public that this evacuation will work in the face of a nuclear accident. Last June, I wrote as I wrote as much to my colleagues in the House and Senate who have jurisdiction over the NRC. I testified before the House Interior Subcommittee on Energy and the Environment the year before, asking that a consensus be developed and legislation presented to reform the NRC. I stand ready today to assist in any way I can to bring this to pass. If we needed more convincing, the licensing of Seabrook Station stands as a monument to an agency that makes up its own rules as it goes along, placing the interests of industry ahead of the health and safety of the public. Mr. Chairman, I hope we can find a way to solve this terrible problem before another cat catastrophe occurs. Do we really want to open new hearings on another Three Mile Island down the road? Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time and attention. 
I deeply hope that these hearings lead to some definitive action toward a more responsible regulation of this industry. The uh, statement of the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Hansen, will be made a part of the record. And if the uh, individuals holding signs in the back of the room will refrain from doing so, uh, I would be very appreciative. Appreciate the statement of the gentleman from Massachusetts. And the subcommittee is delighted to welcome the congressman from New York, Mr. Lent. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I note the presence of the distinguished governor of the state of Massachusetts. and. Uh, if it was the chair's wish that he be accommodated first, I would be happy to uh, defer to the good governor. Governor? The gentleman from New York. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am Congressman Norman Lent, and I represent the 4th District of New York. I serve as the ranking Republican on the Energy and Commerce Committee. I'm appearing before you today to express my deep concern over the actions being taken by this committee. In my view, calling a hearing to discuss emergency evacuation plans at Seabrook just one day before operation of the plant may begin and while a matter is currently pending before the courts violates the Pillsbury Doctrine. In the words of the Court of Appeals in the case of Pillsbury against the Federal Trade Commission, quote, when an investigation focuses directly and substantially upon the mental processes of a commission in a case which is pending before it, Congress is no longer intervening in the agency's legislative function, but rather in its judicial function. To subject an administrator to a searching examination as to how and why he reached his decision in a case still pending before him, and to criticize him for reaching the wrong decision, sacrifices the appearance of impartiality." Unquote. And I think anyone who heard the previous witnesses would agree with me that that has certainly been the case today. Uh, we have heard the most blatant criticism of the NRC's uh, decision. I note that several witnesses, commissioners of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, are appearing here today under protest. It is their belief, and I concur with their judgment, that their testimony is inappropriate at this time, since numerous emergency planning issues are still pending before the NRC. The appropriate forum for review of the Commission's actions in the Seabrook case is now before the courts, not before this committee. Having said this, I would now like to turn to the substance of this hearing. The real question confronting us today is the use of nuclear power as an energy resource in the United States. Currently, nuclear power provides 20 percent, one-fifth, of our nation's energy supply. Seabrook alone will displace the use of some 11 million barrels of foreign oil annually. Nationally, nuclear energy displaces the use of 309 million barrels of oil each year doing so without producing greenhouse gases or other damaging pollutants. This also helps to fulfill our goal of energy independence. This afternoon, the energy, or this morning, the Energy and Commerce Committee began full committee markup of the President's Clean Air Bill. It is ironic that at the very time we are engaging in vigorous debate over clean air and how to reduce the tons of air pollutants at utility plants and what they spew into the atmosphere each day, Seabrook's opponents who profess concern over the environment, continue their crusade against a clean, safe power plant that will reduce our air pollution problems and increase our supply of domestically produced energy. This plant has already been through some 17 years of intense scrutiny. It has passed every test, every hurdle, every obstacle thrown in its past. And these obstacles have been costly. Just this week, the New York Times uh, editorialized that Governor Dukakis, stub that his stubborn refusal to cooperate in devising an emergency evacuation plan has cost consumers in his and adjoining, st adjoining states a total of two billion dollars. That's a billion with a capital B. I'm certain that we are going to hear today the baseless charge that the nuclear power plant licensing process is corrupt, that the NRC is a nuclear industry booster, and that the rules were bent or changed to suit Seabrook. This is utter nonsense. First, if this were all true, Seabrook would have received its license many years ago, not just two weeks ago. And second, the Commission should be assured that despite the pyrotechnics that you gentlemen are hearing today, and ladies, the Commission's decision is in exact accord with Congress's mandate 
as evidenced by the defeat of Congressman Markey's amendment in the 1987 uh, NRC reauthorization bill. This amendment aimed directly at the Seabrook plant would have prohibited issuance of an operating license on the basis of an emergency plan developed by the Seabrook utility. And I would like to remind my colleagues here today that the Markey Amendment was debated over several hours on the House floor in the evening when we were all there. We covered the same uh, maps. I remember those maps, the same photographs. I remember them, the same charges uh, uh, that we have heard here today. The Markey Amendment was defeated on the floor of the House by a vote of 261 to 160 in August 1987. Lastly, I would assert that if the licensing process has been corrupted, that corruption has been caused by the anti-nuclear zealots who criticized the process so vigorously. The corruption occurs this way. It occurs when so-called citizens groups intervene when a plant, properly sited, safely constructed, is virtually complete. These zealots follow a well-defined pattern raising objections to cost overruns that they themselves have exacerbated and claiming that the plant is unsafe, not on the basis of any technical expertise, for in most instances they have no technical training to make that judgment, but because it runs counter to their philosophy. 19, since 1978, the NRC has responded to the legitimate public concern over nuclear safety by adding some 2,000 new regulations for plants to meet. The argument that regulations have decreased and safety has been diluted might make good rhetoric but does not stand the test of truth. In the case of Seabrook, we have seen the longest, costliest, most heavily scrutinized licensing procedure in American history. The plan has been tested, evaluated, investigated, retested, and re-examined more than any industrial facility in the world. It has passed every test and it has earned the right to operate. The attitude of the anti-Seabrook obstructionists is wrong. It's not what Congress intended. We are not here today really to discuss a single plant, a single utility, or a single state. We are talking about national energy policy, about cleaning the environment, about competing in the world market. The New York Times said it best when it stated, quote, it's leaders like Governor Dukakis who obstruct the one kind of baseload power plant that produces no greenhouse gases. In the crowded annals of human folly, the saga of Seabrook will surely rate a space. My colleagues, we must act responsibly to ensure that the United States can preserve the nuclear option as one of the methods we have to produce what has become the economic lifeblood of our nation's economy, electricity. We need the will to make tough choices based on the scientific merits of a proven technology, not on its ideological appeal. It's time that we acted together to do what is right for the vast majority of the American people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your attention. Gentleman from Alaska. Mr. Chairman, I have one question for the gentleman. It's unfortunate that the senators had to leave. I had some questions for him, too. But um, your area will be served by the Seabrook when it's open uh, as far as the power source? No, my, my area is down on Long Island. We were to have been served by another nuclear plant, the Shoreham nuclear plant. What did that cost your consumers? has been uh, closed down, as you know. What, does that, what do you think that's cost your consumers? Well, the lowball figure that has been given to us by Governor Cuomo uh, is that it's only going to cost ratepayers 68 percent more in utility rates over the course of the next 10 years. That's, included, it, that's all. Everybody, including the poor, they're trying to help. Is that correct? That's right. And I say lowball because it's predicated upon this assumption that oil for the next 10 years is going to cost $14.50 a barrel. It is now $21 a barrel. For and it's going to $35 a barrel by 1995, according to most of the experts who know this uh, field well. I serve on the Energy uh, Committee, and this is the evidence that we have been given. So I would estimate that my constituents, and I don't really wish this for the, the people in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and New England. That's why I'm here. Somebody ought to warn those people in New England that if Seabrook is closed down, the same thing is going to happen to them as happened to my constituents, my unlucky constituents on Long Island. Their rates are going to skyrocket right through the roof. On Long Island, it will be better than 120% increase in their electricity rates, and that is just to pay for the closure of the Shoreham plant, not even to pay for the three to five additional nuclear plants, we're uh, additional power plants, fossil fuel plants, 
we're going to have to build on Long Island to replace the 800 megawatts of power that will be lost by the closure of that nuclear plant. That's going to cost God knows how much more money. The people don't know this. Someone has to warn them that it shouldn't happen to the people of New England what is happening to my people on Long Island. Thank you. Uh, Governor Dukakis, uh, there is a vote on the floor of the House in about seven minutes, so the subcommittee will have to stand adjourned for that time and will return shortly thereafter. I would say. Congressman Lent won't leave. Because I'd love to. He has to vote the chance for him to listen to me after you come back. Here. Well, uh, Congressman Lent. He knows very little about this plant. This Congressman Lent has to vote also. He's, of course, well, more than welcome. come back. More than welcome to come back, but we'll resume shortly after four o'clock when and, the House and votes. Governor, and Governor, in all due respects, he offered you a chance to go first. Oh, I understand. I'm glad I waited, Congressman, because now I have a chance to respond. The sub uh, subcommittee stands adjourned. At which all. point, we will receive the uh, Thank you. testimony of Governor Dukakis of Massachusetts. Thank you, Governor. Our next um, witness um, that I will have the honor of uh, introducing. Uh, pending the return of uh, Chairman Kossmeyer is the great governor of the good state of Massachusetts, Michael Dukakis. We welcome you today, you, Governor. Ed. We appreciate the difficulty in, uh, um, in uh, your travel here today. And uh, we know, though, that you're, you're doing this because of the, imp the importance which you attach to an issue that you have uh, fought uh, very hard and uh, on a committed basis over many years on it. We very much appreciate it, the effort that you've made. And uh, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin your testimony. Thanks, uh, Congressman, very much. And my thanks to the members of the committee. I'm sorry Congressman Lent didn't stick around because uh, it's obvious that he knows very, very little about this project, about the area surrounding it, or for that matter, the history of it. And while I'm sorry that the same editorial writer, the New York Times, that's been beating Governor Cuomo over the head consistently for the past uh, seven or eight years has decided to take me on, uh, uh, Congressman Lent must know that the electricity coming out of Seabrook, if the plant is ever open, will be the most expensive electricity ever produced in the United States of America for public use, and that the ratepayers of the state of New Hampshire alone are looking at rate increases of 60 to 70 percent, probably higher, with electricity at a cost of, what, some 22, 23 cents a kilowatt hour, which is only three times plus what we are paying on average uh, in New England. So if he thinks uh, that somehow this is going to be a bargain for the consumers of electricity uh, in New England, he has a lot to do to inform himself on that issue. Um, I do appreciate Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the opportunity to appear before you today. And I want to commend you for beginning this investigation into the licensing of the Seabrook nuclear power plant. I want especially to commend two good friends as well, Congressman Nick Pavulis, who has just given you in detail the sad history of this plant, and Congressman Markey, who have worked tirelessly on behalf of the safety and the best interests of the people of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Mr. Chairman, neither the public health and safety of the people of Massachusetts nor of the people of New Hampshire are today being protected by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Because what the NRC did on the 1st of March was to complete a job it began three and a half years ago, the job of gutting off-site emergency preparedness rules that this Congress insisted on over 10 years ago in the wake of the Three Mile Island accident. Many of you are already familiar with the Seabrook story. In 1986, after extensive state and local participation in a planning process, I concluded, and here I'm quoting from the statement I made at that time, that if a serious accident at Seabrook occurs, as I'm told to assume it would and must, by the way, under the law and the rules of the Commission in reviewing the evacuation plan, the combination of conditions at Seabrook, including principally weather, inadequate sheltering, and exit routes, and the altitude of the radioactive plume, either individually or more likely in combination, create a foreseeable likelihood of high dosages of radioactive intake against which emergency planning and evacuation cannot adequately protect. I made that judgment on the Seabrook evacuation planning in good faith, as did Governor Cuomo on Shoreham. 
Anybody who knows anything about the location of these two plants knows that it would be virtually impossible to evacuate the area around them under the best of circumstances. To do so in the event of a nuclear accident would be utterly impossible. And what response have we had from the NRC? To change its rules and to suggest that we never had the authority to reach these decisions that we made in the first place. And this, in the face of a statement by President Reagan to one of your former colleagues, Congressman Kearney, in 1984, in which the President pledged at that time that the federal government would never override the authority of state and local governments in emergency planning of this kind. More recently, the NRSA, NRC has taken an even more extreme position. Now it is decided that state governments do not have to be directly involved in evacuation planning at all. In fact, the Commission instructed nuclear plant managers to assume that state governments will hand over total authority to them in the event of an accident. And in recent months, our nuclear regulators have ruled that evacuation planners need not worry about protecting citizens against various levels of radiation because radiation doses are, in its words, irrelevant. Is it any wonder, Mr. Chairman, that on February 15th of this year, the Commission's own advisory board, the Advisory Committee on Reactor Safeguards, issued a report calling for the creation of a new and independent board to review overreaching by the NRC and noted that, and I quote, it's almost as if the NRC were created to be incoherent. I wish it was simply a question of incoherence. But in fact, as I think we all now know, there is a method to the NRC's madness. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts has been coming here to Washington now for 20 years. Tell first the Atomic Energy Commission and then the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that the area around the Seabrook nuclear power plant could not be protected in the event of a nuclear accident. We first raised these objections in the early 1970s, before the NRC allowed the plant's owners to spend billions of dollars on the plant. We implored the NRC to resolve safety issues before issuing a construction permit. Our objections were dismissed as premature, and we were told that we would have our day in court later. Chairman, the situation at Seabrook has not changed since the 1970s. In fact, the situation is worse. Residential development in the Seabrook area has increased substantially since that time. The local beaches welcome even more hundreds of thousands of visitors in the summertime. The road network around the New Hampshire-Massachusetts border still backs up for miles at peak periods. Now, I understand that the reasons the NRC gives us for its decision on emergency planning will be a central issue in the litigation which is currently before the courts. But this issue should also be a principal concern of this congressional inquiry. Because on March 1st, 1990, the NRC issued a memorandum and order which concluded, unbelievable as this might sound, that potential exposure to radiation in the event of an accident is essentially irrelevant. So long, according to the NRC, as the emergency plan meets certain procedural guidelines, guidelines, it will be approved whether or not it, and here I'm quoting, achieves any particular radiation dose savings for the population in the emergency planning zone. The NRC goes on to tell us in the March 1st order that emergency planning is essential, just as adequate lifeboats are essential for a liner carrying passengers at sea. Mr. Chairman, a lifeboat that won't float is no lifeboat at all. And emergency plans that don't protect people can hardly be deemed adequate. Mr. Chairman, it's inconceivable to anyone who is familiar with the debate after the Three Mile Island accident that this is what Congress intended. The Seabrook nuclear power plant has now been completed at a cost of $6 billion. If it, ever, if it ever opens, to repeat, it will produce the most expensive electric power in the history of the United States. It will be a millstone around the economic future of New England, and it will be a threat to the public health and safety. We can do better than that. I look forward to working with, with you and the Congress to make sure that we do. Mr. Chairman, if you or members of the committee have any questions, I'd be happy to respond. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. To Mr. Uh, Governor, uh, first of all, let me join with my colleagues in welcoming you here. It's a pleasure thank to you, see Mr. you uh, again.
Thank uh, you. Governor, what are the alternatives to nuclear power in terms of providing that kind of energy that uh, your region of the country needs? Mr. Chairman, in 1986, uh, as the chairman of the New England Governors Conference, um, I led with my fellow governors, three Republicans and three Democrats, uh, two, three Republicans and two Democrats and myself, a year-long study of the energy future of New England. We proposed a plan at that time emphasizing a combination of efficiency and conservation. And by the way, I'm happy to say that as of yesterday, one of our major utilities has just announced a pioneering breakthrough in conservation and efficiency, encouraged, by the way, by our own Public Utilities Commission. And the Massachusetts Business Roundtable has just issued a report which makes conservation and efficiency the cornerstone of our energy future. Um, the encouragement of a growing and expanding independent power generation industry, which is already well underway or has completed a number of uh, principally gas-fired plants in Massachusetts and New England, and there are more coming, and I would encourage that. And the development of new, safe, and non-polluting technologies. Um, we're very much encouraged by uh, the kinds of developments uh, that we've seen. We are encouraging the kind of uh, principally gas-fired generation that we're already uh, beginning to enjoy. Um, just to give you, uh, Mr. Chairman, one example of, of what is possible, uh, the Boston Edison Company today has a mothball plant just a few miles from Boston, the so-called Edgar Station plant in Weymouth, uh, which could be the site of a 1,200 megawatt gas-fired power plant, 100 megawatts more than Seabrook with capital costs at a fraction of what Seabrook has cost. And in fact, the uh, Edison Company is already beginning the planning for, uh, for that plant. So I don't think there's any question that a combination of uh, significant and improved efficiency uh, and efficient use of our existing energy supply and uh, continued expansion of these uh, various new generating sources will more than meet the energy needs of uh, New England. Uh, what they won't do is require us to go through uh, the kind of process we've gone through with respect to Seabrook, and of course they'll be much less expensive. Governor, one more question if I could. What if this uh, plant uh, is put into operation and on a hot summer day there's an accident, a serious nuclear accident there? Well, if that happens, uh, quite obviously, Mr. Chairman, uh, all of us will do our best to deal with it, but uh, I can tell you uh, without, I think, fear of contradiction that it is simply going to be impossible for us to protect the public health and safety of the people and communities surrounding that plant. Um, and anyone who knows it, understands it, has looked at it, and has looked around would, uh, I think, confirm that statement. Uh, you can't get people out of there in less than three hours on a hot Saturday afternoon in the middle of the summertime. God help us if we had an accident. So uh, while I'm sure all of us will do what we can to help. Uh, there's simply no way that uh, the public health and safety can be protected. And by the way, uh, under the NRC order, uh, no sheltering is being provided at all, even on a temporary basis, for those trapped under these circumstances. Nor has the NRC re required it. So that uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, there, there is no way that we can, we can protect people and communities in that area, or for that matter, outside of the evacuation area, because obviously the impact of this will be felt far beyond the 10-mile zone. Thank you, Governor, very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Chair recognizes the gentleman from Alaska, Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As difficult as it may be, I'm glad you recognize me. I appreciate that. Um, Governor, I uh, am interested, as you well are aware of, uh, I don't particularly support your, your delegation's position on energy nor your own. And I say that respectfully. You have your constituency mm -hmm. to represent, and I have mine. No, I, I'd be interested in, in how we differ. Because when you say gas, where are you getting your gas from? Getting it from Canada and from Good. the Southwest. Foreign, foreign, foreign. No, and from the Southwest. And, and foreign and gas, and I know the energy field probably as well as anybody. We are running out of gas. We are running well, out of gas. that'll be news to our neighbors in Canada. Unless, yeah, then you go to your neighbors in Canada. Sure. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, if I have any more uh, comments from the audience, I'm yes. speaking to the governor. The, the gentleman from Alaska's point is very well taken. He's absolutely right. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I will suggest respectfully a few of them in the room had better learn something else, too, about this process. I'm asking a legitimate question. You say you get gas from Canada. And, gas, from, the, and from the Southwest. Which is running out in the Southwest. 
And that's a fact, that's not anything else. So we eliminate the gas. And I, I'm just curious, and it's not only you, Governor, I heard from your great senator um, about a rush shod, a rush job. When did this first Seabrook uh, license, was it applied for? Well, it was applied for at least as far back as the early 70s and maybe earlier. Uh, 17 years to be exact. Yeah. I don't exactly call that rough shod. Well, I Congress mean, it's a could long help. period of time. And it's been through five administrations. Uh, I believe eight different Congresses or nine different Congresses. And there has been comments made by, I'm not sure yourself because I didn't hear your testimony and I read it. I didn't see the word that laws have been broken, but it's my understanding that in fact the state of Massachusetts uh, did take the NRC to um, court and you lost. Is that correct? Well, we've lost on some preliminary matters. Uh, we are now in court on what might be called the central issue. But the truth of the matter, we're having these hearings today to try to sway possibility of the issuance of the permit to go forth tomorrow. Is that correct? Well, you'll have to ask your colleagues about that. I assume we're inquiring into the activities of an important federal regulatory agency whose principal responsibility is the protection of the public health and safety, well, it just, it's and asking whether or not, in fact, the NRC is protecting the public health and safety. Well, I assume that's why I'm here. And, uh, well, I appreciate right. your being. And by the way, we had lots of testimony of a lot of colleagues who you could get here. I mean, they went on and on and on, Thank including you. myself. Appreciate it. And your consideration, your, I, we understood the plane problems. I hope it wasn't a Trump plane. I'll be very, very upset. No, but you if you want to hear my speech on the importance of high-speed rail in the Northeast well, Corridor, I'll be happy to deliver that which, too, Congressman. Which, which we'd, we'd be glad to hear if you have the energy to run them. Uh, I know that's something we that do. You, you do. I, I like to know where it's at because, you know, every book I read, every statistics I read, it ain't there. It's not in the sky. You say it is. It's not. And I have a little, little problem, you know, about the cost factor. We're going to hear from another gentleman a little later on about how much this is going to cost. The delays themselves, which you have been part of, how much does that cost the consumer? A uh, small fraction of well, the cost of Well, what's the fraction? Is it $1 billion, $2 well, billion, $3 you, billion? you can ask other witnesses. Let me say this to you. There's no question that, that even without the delays, the cost of overruns in this plant were at least four times the original estimate, uh, Congressman. And uh, if, if I may say, that's, though, uh, that's, that's quite a testimonial to the ability of the people who planned this project in the first place to project costs. Well, the difference, though, is between if you were a contractor and you thought you had a contract to build a certain project, and because of court action, congressional action, uh, pressure groups change that project's plans consistently. Does not add to the cost. Well, what do you think uh, we added to the cost, Congressman? Well, I think about two billion dollars. If I'm on, I, a, I, I on, a, on a six billion dollar project. Well, two billion dollars. The B and the B is still. So a lot we'll money. agree that uh, this I, was at least four times over the original estimates. No, I don't agree with that. Well, the original all. estimate was about a billion. Well, I'm saying two billion. You agree? You agree that two billion is worth it? No, I won't agree to two billion, but even accepting your figure, I gather we agree that this plant cost at least four times the original estimate. Well, I know we could banter this around all day, but I would suggest, you know, delays which have occurred. And by the way, Governor, have you been to this plant? Have I been there? Yeah. Of course. You've been there. You can't avoid it. Well, I, I, I'm serious. I mean, it, I, I, it looms I, 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 up. It I, I, looms I, I, up like I, I, some I, kind of gray I, monster in the sky, Congressman. You I'm can't just, avoid I'm it. Just asking have you been there? Yes. What did you think of it? I, like, frankly, think it's just like any other nuclear plant. You see one, you see them all. Well, I'll take that message back okay. to uh, the good take people the Reagan, in that area. I'm sure they'll okay, be, in, uh, I'm sure they'll be uh, reassured, question, Congressman. Mr. Chairman, last question. Uh, you know, just out of curiosity, have you toured the plant? You mean inside? Yes. No, I've never been inside Thank the you. plant. Now, may I uh, respond, Mr. Chairman, to just one of the comments that course, uh, the government. Congressman yeah. made? Uh, I'm, I'm interested in his comment about gas. Uh, you know, if gas supplies are so short, I don't know why we have one of the fastest growing industries in New England that's involved in building gas-fired transmission plants, uh, Congressman. I just no broke ground on one uh, this past fall. We have a number of others currently before us. Do you think all of these people are misinformed? I will say you respectfully, they are doing it because there's no other source at this time for your constituents. Now, if you want gas, my friend, Governor Cuomo, my side of the aisle, I'll give you gas. You're against opening Anwar in Alaska. It was I'm part of your I'm platform, opening Anwar in Alaska, open yeah. the Arctic Wildlife Range. It has 39 billion barrels of mm -hmm. oil, plus, now get this, 47 trillion cubic feet of gas available for your constituents, and you were against it. You were the only state in the union, the only state in the union that came down 
when it was proposed that had a little minority view that opposed it. The only state. Well, do you think all of these hard-headed businessmen who are uh, going to the banks and getting loans to build these gas-fired plants uh, doing so because they don't think they can have enough gas? Governor, with your bond rating, I'm surprised they can borrow the money. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. May I say that Massachusetts uh, still has a more stable revenue base than the state of Alaska, and I'm glad we do. Yes, uh, Oh, Mr. Governor, I beg to differ with you. Well, you differ with me. You've got 12 billion barrels in the bank, have you? Well, when you guys run out of oil, you'll have your revenue problems, believe me. Uh, Mr. Markey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Governor, I, I, uh, I welcome you to the Interior Committee. Uh, I've, uh, it's nice to be here. I've uh, served here happily for 14 years. Um, hey, we've got to get uh, the congressman together with some of these people that are building all these gas-fired plants, uh, Ed, so they can are, have a discussion. Uh, there are uh, many reasons, I think, why uh, Paul Song used to be a colleague of mine here and up through 1978, uh, but he found that he might want to serve in the Senate instead of here. But the um, Massachusetts economy has done quite well, thank you, in the 1980s. Indeed it has, and it will Congress, do very well in the 1990s. Uh, and uh, uh, there are many states, I'm sure, in the Union that would like the recession in their state to be defined by 4.3 percent unemployment, uh, which is where we are right now. And um, to a certain extent, uh, and I say this out of tribute to the governor, we've been, we've been up so long it looks like down to some people when you're at 4.3 percent unemployment. But I can promise you that uh, my district with uh, near 3 percent unemployment for uh, approximately six years in a row uh, greatly benefited from the economic policies which uh, Governor Dukakis put in place. And you have to understand now, Governor, um, we have philosophical differences on this committee. Gentleman from Alaska is not a free trader. We are free traders. Okay, we believe in an open, uh, open well, commerce. Well, the gentleman, you, who's, um, opposed, well, who's opposed to exporting oil? You are. The gentleman. I want to export my oil, uh, and you don't want to. I, 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 I uh, have not yielded to the gentleman. The, the, the gentleman from uh, Alaska has yet to understand the free flow of commerce between uh, New England and uh, Canada, uh, which we've uh, encouraged. And, uh, including, by the way, hydropower, as you know. Including hydropower coming our way, but also including our computers going their way and other products that we make in our region. That's correct. And that open free trade has, in fact, led to an enormously prosperous economy for both parts of That's both correct. countries over uh, many, many generations. And, That's correct. And uh, notwithstanding any sideline uh, quarterbacking from other parts of the country, I think we've done very well, and it's a compliment to you. And that free trade. I think should continue, notwithstanding the, the, uh, the protectionism that many others would have us adopt towards Canada. I think that, as well, uh, it's important to note that the problem with the gas from the southwestern part of our country is not its, uh, is not its existence, it's the shortage of drilling. Uh, and in fact, we are working, uh, as a New England uh, Congressional Caucus, to build a pipeline up from uh, the Southwest, uh, working with the New England governors under your leadership to ensure that we have the flow coming from that direction, and the southwestern part of the country ensures us that it's there uh, in ample very supply. Anxious, very anxious to provide us with the gas that we need. And, and, uh, and we intend on uh, continuing uh, on that course. Um, and uh, to the question of our legitimate legislative inquiry into the laws which were put on the books uh, uh, here in the Interior Committee then adopted by the entire House. Uh, we might note that we're here on that track even as our Attorney General Jim Shannon is vigorously uh, prosecuting the case uh, at the Circuit Court uh, of Appeals, working on that track as well. Not to, uh, that we, sh I think uh, the suggestion should be made that we shouldn't exhaust uh, each of our, uh, our remedies uh, under the Constitution of the United States. Um, Governor, if, if, um, if uh, one question is posed on an ongoing basis, it is um, the sincerity with which the state of Massachusetts attempted to, in fact, put together emergency evacuation plans, try to comply for many months, with the law. For many could months, you, Congressman. Could you give us your um, chronology, your, your history of the efforts which you made, your administration made to and the, and the local well, we, cities and towns. We went at the emergency planning process uh, intensively and exhaustively. Uh, we started with the assumption that uh, an evacuation plan could be developed 
that protected the public health and safety. At that time, we were talking with the utility about uh, sheltering, about, in fact, the possibility of constructing buildings which would provide shelter in the case of uh, an accident. I don't think there's any question that uh, the events at Chernobyl had a profound impact on me personally and on a great many of us when we saw what happened there. But the longer we looked at it and the more we got into it and the more questions the, we asked, uh, the more obvious it w was that um, there was simply no way in this uh, heavily congested, uh, heavily settled area that uh, one could have an evacuation plan which, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, could protect people. And uh, it was only after months and months and months of uh, investigation, study, discussion, and the rest of it that we concluded that it simply wasn't possible. And it was at that time that I made the decision that I made. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for coming down. Good Great to be service. with you. Governor, thank you very much. Oh, the gentleman from Nevada, I beg your pardon. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, uh, since I was in another committee, I was unable to be here earlier. I understand that my statement has been made a part of the record. The uh, statement of the gentlelady from the state of Nevada is a part of, has been made a part of the record, yes. Thank you very much. Um, Governor Dukakis, obviously, we, uh, on different sides of the aisle, you're well aware that we do have different viewpoints on these issues, but uh, I'm always uh, careful that I don't come to the support of the NRC because I have a very difficult situation in my own state, which I'm sure you're well aware of. But um, And which the uh, opening of Seabrook will exacerbate, since we'll just have some more nuclear waste to dump uh, in well, your state. Um, I don't think it's going to come. It's got to go someplace. Uh, yeah. Well, it does have to go someplace. And I think that uh, all of these issues, in spite of the fact we have some philosophical differences, I think we all are really trying to find some answers. And um, one of the statements that I'd like to make, and this really isn't any question, I, I agree with your quote when you said that, um, you, this, that you will have your day in court. But some of us who sit here feel that this isn't the place, uh, since we do have legal challenges going on and we, we do have uh, some other things going on, why we really feel that perhaps this isn't the place for the debate on the evacuation. Um, but I appreciate your being here. I think all of us are concerned about these issues and hopefully we can resolve them without too many uh, real problems. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman, may I just respond uh, briefly to that? Uh, first, um, uh, I think this is an appropriate forum, and in fact the only forum, in which uh, members of Congress and those of us who are interested and involved citizens can explore whether or not the original intent of the Congress 11 years ago is in fact being carried out by the NRC. I think that's a very appropriate function for the Congress. If it isn't, then I think uh, you would agree with me that all of you, regardless of party and regardless of philosophy, um, have a responsibility to make sure that uh, what the Congress did after Three Mile Island is in fact uh, carried out by the NRC. Uh, the only other thing I would say to you is that uh, I don't view this as a matter of philosophy. I mean, I'm not philosophically or ideologically opposed to nuclear power or any other kind of power. Uh, what I'm concerned about, and what I assume uh, you're concerned about, uh, is three basic issues. One, is it economically sound to produce electricity which is three or three and a half times the average cost of electricity in my region when there are other alternative ways of producing it or saving it or using it better which are much less expensive. Secondly, uh, in locating these plants, are we doing so in areas where the public health and safety can be protected in the event of an accident? And thirdly, at a time when uh, some nearly 45 years after the passage of the Atomic Energy Act, we still don't know what to do with the waste, as you know particularly, given your state's difficulties with uh, its designation as a potential uh, depository for this stuff, why are we producing more of the garbage when we don't know where to put it? And I would simply say to you that uh, if over the next five or 10 or 15 or 20 years, people can give us answers to that, 
then I certainly would have no objection with uh, proceeding with investments in nuclear energy. But until we answer those questions, it seems to me uh, we've got a responsibility, all of us, regardless of uh, party or where we are in the political spectrum, to look for alternatives. In New England, we have. Uh, we're satisfied that we can meet the energy needs of the region for the foreseeable future with uh, a variety of alternatives. And uh, if, as the Massachusetts Business Roundtable in its report uh, indicated the other day, in uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years, uh, we do have answers to these issues. If there are new nuclear technologies which are safe, and if we have an answer to the question of how you dispose of the waste, then um, I'm certainly not going to have any problem with being supportive of that technology. The problem is that those questions have not been answered at the present time, and you know that uh, better than anybody, given uh, the unique position of Nevada in this. And until they are, it seems to me uh, we all have a responsibility to look for other sources. First argument, however, about the economic issue, um, isn't this going to be, if it, if it ever comes online, it will, you have said that it would be the most expensive electricity. Right. But uh, in a sense, if it doesn't come online, isn't it going to be the most expensive electricity not generated? No, because the ratepayers of New England will not have to absorb the cost. We, uh, we, don't, we're, we, we, won't, we don't allow, at least New Hampshire, I think I'm correct in saying, uh, out of the existing law of New Hampshire, um, the people of New Hampshire and the ratepayers of New Hampshire will not have to absorb the cost. Now, what the New York situation is another one is, is another matter. but. Uh, I think the existing laws in the state of New Hampshire are that uh, the cost will not be absorbed unless and until it goes online, and that's been a major political issue in the state of New Hampshire, which, by the way, has defeated and elected governors, among other things. But uh, New Hampshire does not, uh, does not accept the proposition that uh, the fact that money has been spent on construction uh, will, uh, will have to be absorbed by the ratepayer. And in fact, if it doesn't go online, the ratepayer will not have to absorb this cost as I understand the state of the law in New Hampshire. Um, well, I thank you very much, uh, Governor. Appreciate your testimony. Mr. Thank Chairman, you, Mr. Chairman. Be happy to yield. I think that Nevada offers a very interesting uh, parallel situation uh, where the state does feel beleaguered by the decisions that have been no made question. at a federal level in terms of nuclear issues and the adequacy of protection for the health and safety of people who live in the near vicinity of that facility. And to the extent to which there will be a court case pending uh, in the very near future, uh, I doubt very seriously that it would at the same time preclude House and Senate hearings that will have to continue on that nuclear waste uh, repository question. And I think that uh, we should be mindful of that in terms of the likelihood that other uh, areas of the country would also want to ensure that they can avail themselves of those two branches of government while still abiding by the legal prescriptions that exist in terms of what either I uh, can in fact engage in legally as a uh, conduct. Well, as you probably know, our state has already filed suit and uh, then we've had a countersuit from the Department of Energy or vice versa and uh, it's, it's a very tough issue for us but out But you wouldn't there. argue uh, that that would preclude congressional hearings on the subject, would you? No, I certainly wouldn't. No, the... certainly not. But when sure. something is pending, why obviously I think all of us, it's up to the courts then, if it's that's where it is, then I think we have to wait and see. I don't think that we necessarily have to get in the middle of the fray until at least some decisions are made. Well, I. You, you are in a better position to speak for the people of Nevada than I am, but I must say that uh, I suspect if they come to you and say, look, we think something's wrong here and we want the Congress to look at it, I would assume that you would you bet. be here, court suit or no court suit. And that's the way our system works. And in the last analysis, this is the people's forum. So uh, I hope the good people of the state of Nevada will, will seek redress in the Congress if, if this well, is where... Well, I think that'll be next. And, uh, and that, I assume, is something they can do and you would support whether or not there's a court suit pending. And I take the same position with respect to this particular power plant. Thank Go you very Governor, much. Governor, let me say that uh, this is the Subcommittee on General Oversight and Investigations of the House Interior Committee. Oversight is a congressional word. It means very simply, as you can imagine, overseeing the laws that they are properly carried out. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is in the jurisdiction of the Interior Committee. Right. Uh, each year or every several years, we authorize their budget. The commissioners who are here right. today sitting behind you come before this committee and we authorize their budget. Right. This is entirely appropriate that this matter be taken up by the Oversight Subcommittee 
of the House Interior Committee. I say that with all due deference to my very good friend from Nevada, whom I have the greatest respect. Governor, let me say that uh, the subcommittee is honored to have you before us. Uh, I'm honored to be with you, and I stand ready to assist you in any way uh, we can. And we will, needless to say, pursue our remedies in the courts, Mr. Chairman. But uh, if our experience uh, with this plant, with the NRC, is helpful to others as they deal with similar problems, uh, that in and of itself, I think, will be helpful. But we are very, very serious about this matter. and. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the more we inquire and the more we look, the more concerned we are. So we're delighted to, if you are conducting these hearings, and be happy to provide you with any additional information we can. Governor, thank you for coming you, to Washington. Chairman. It's good to see you, as it always thank is. You. Thank you. The uh, next panel, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Chairman Kenneth M. Carr, Commissioner James R. Curtis, Commissioner Roberts is sick and not will not be here. Commissioner Roberts is ill and will not be here, apparently. Commissioner Kenneth C. Rogers and Commissioner Forrest J. Remick. Peter, this is Steve Ross from the House Chairman. Right, no, Steve. Hey, Steve. Steve. Okay. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Commission, good afternoon. 